Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Art Deco Neighborhood Association's first candidates forum. The forum is going to be recorded, and as such, we ask that all phones be silenced and that there is quiet in the room while our candidates speak. My name is Irene Bigger, as Daniel mentioned. I'm the president of our association, and along with our vice president, Jane Krupp, our secretary, Lindsay Hazel Farrington, and our directors, board directors, um, Eugene Rodriguez and Nina Worth. We'd like to thank you all for participating in this public forum. We would also like to thank Daniel Seraldo and the MDPL staff for their generosity and support uh, for this gathering. ADNA represents roughly 854 registered voters in our defined area within the Art Deco Cultural District. And it's between 15th Street, the north of 5th Street, and between the ocean and both sides of Washington Avenue. Adding in direct adjacent areas from 3rd Street to 16th Streets, we have 475 additional voters, totaling 1,329 voters that surround Loomis Park in districts 41, 42, and 43. And we formed our neighborhood association this year as we felt residents who live and vote in the MXZ or ADCD were underrepresented in our city government and needed a means to be heard. And as such, we started our nonprofit. This so called entertainment district, MXZ, ABCD, the strip, ground zero for crime and chaos at times, whatever you want to call it. It's image, brand, and crime, and more that is broadcast on social media and on the news, seeps out to the rest of the city and dominates the message of our global brand. What happens on Ocean Drive stays on Ocean Drive. No, it does not stay on Ocean Drive. <laughs> Residents here and throughout the city are now prepared and committed to participate in and inspire change in Miami Beach. The city often cites consultation with stakeholders in determining recommendations to our elected officials, but in reality, it is us, the residents, that are the stakeholders and that are rarely consulted. As members of ADNA and our neighborhood at large, we are the stakeholders on the ground as the eyes and ears, coalescing our surprisingly large number of residential registered voters whose needs somehow get lost and unaddressed. We will be looking to our new commission in December to ensure that this changes and residents' needs are heard and brought into balance with the existing commercial monoliths in the ADCD. We expect transparency and accountability from our elected officials, committee members, board members, city employees, and staff. And I'll repeat. What happens on Ocean Drive does not stay on Ocean Drive. We have so much potential to do better. So the format for this evening, we have two candidates in each group seated together that will be called on to respond to each question in numerical orders four, five, and six. The first six minute long segment will allow each candidate one minute to introduce themselves. The second 60 minute long segment will consist of four questions, each with a 15 minute debate period. It will allow for two minutes for a direct response to each question, followed by a 30 second rebuttal from each candidate for each question. The third 12 minute long segment will be a lightning round of four questions that will be allowed a 30 second response per candidate per question. We will then conclude our forum with audience participation and an opportunity to informally mingle with the candidates. Right, and Jane just mentioned yes. Before that, we will allow the candidates one minute for closing words after the lightning. 
So without further ado, please help me welcome the candidates. In group four, Commissioner Stephen Miner C, we have Andre Sassion. Ms. Tanya katsoff bot In group five, Commissioner Ricky Ariola seat, we have Mitch Novick. And David Suarez. In group six, Commissioner David Richardson seat, we have Joseph Magazine. And Marcella McGowan. Beginning with our first segment, can each of you please take one minute to introduce yourselves? Fantastic. My name is Andres Asion, uh, and I am a born and raised Miami Beach resident. I've lived here my whole life. My mom first moved to Miami Beach in 1961, right here to Ocean Drive at the Colony Hotel, and stayed there for about six months until she moved to Meridian, and then on to, to her final home. This is home for me. I live six blocks away off of First and Alton Road from District. And I spend my time here, I eat here, I run, run my bike here, I run here. I'm very frustrated that for the past five years, I've been trying to push to have officers be designated to Ocean Drive. And it's frustrating to see that we still do not have officers designated to Ocean Drive. We have officers for the entertainment district, but not Ocean Drive that do not move from here. And we should never not have a minimum of two officers that are here at prime time here in Ocean Drive. And thank you. So it's great to be here. Tanya, hats off, Bob. This is a homecoming because I've been on the board of MBPL for, you know, since 2018 and as president of Miami Beach United for the last five years. It is a thrill to see the Art Deco Neighborhood Association become a thing. I feel like I sent another kid off to college when Elizabeth Latone and Sam Latone and their neighborhood did the same thing for the Allison Park Neighborhood Association, another kid off to college, because that is what makes Miami Beach so special. In addition to this amazing architecture and this stunning beach and engaged residents, it's the fact that we residents can have a voice in our government. And as a resident who got increasingly involved with our government over the, since 2015, the more I learned, the more frustrated it got. And I knew that I could do better for all of us. So that is why I'm running to make Miami Beach a better beach for all of us together. Thank you. Hi, I am Mitch Novick. I'm a long-term resident, business owner, and activist who lives a block away in the Ocean Drive Entertainment District. You've seen my videos broadcasting the chaos and mayhem uh, that arises from this neighborhood. About a decade ago, I made it a mission to bring attention to the blight, the problems, and the fact that taxpayers are fully subsidizing this neighborhood to a net loss to between six and $38 million, according to the city. I believe the higher number Things need to change. If elected, they will. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Suarez. I'm a South Florida native. And since we only have a minute left, I want to share with you the one issue that I think will help Ocean Drive. And that's accountability. Right now, in City Hall, there is zero accountability. I just got back from uh, a meeting, a commission meeting, where they approved another air, uh, bed and breakfast in a residential neighborhood. And it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating to know that the city doesn't have our best interests. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm running. I'm running on a quality of life platform. Uh, my previous results as an activist prove that. And so, thank you for having me. Hi, all. My name is Joseph Magazine. Uh, I 
thank everybody for coming out and being actively engaged residents and caring about your city and our community. I lived here in Miami Beach for over 10 years. My entire family lives here. Both of my parents, Donna and Joe Sr., my beautiful wife, Daniela, and our six-year-old daughter that we're raising right here in Miami Beach, Cochrane. In many ways, Ocean Drive is synonymous with Miami Beach. Sometimes that could be for the good, sometimes that could be for the bad. But this street right here is so iconic, it identifies Miami Beach. What happens here has an impact everywhere else, for better or for worse. This was the first date my wife and I went on years and years ago, down here at the News Cafe. So Ocean Drive has always held a special place in my heart. Now we need to fight to maintain that iconic image and make sure that Ocean Drive and the surrounding areas get back to the days where they elevate the brand image, the iconic imagery of what represents Ocean Drive, as opposed to detracts it from it, like has happened in recent years. So I appreciate your time, and thank you for the, the care of our community. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marcella Novella. 22 years ago, I moved to Hayden, Pennsylvania. I moved there to an apartment which was a one bedroom overlooking an alley, and it was the most magnificent place I ever lived. Why? Because I had this. This is everything. Our historic district, Collins Avenue, Ocean Drive, it was filled with life. It was filled with locals. It was filled with happiness. It was a place where I would go on a daily basis just to pass my time. I, will, I want those days back. I want a cleaner and safer area. Collins Avenue used to be a retail hub where you could go and shop and get anything you needed and wanted. This place used to thrive. And I remember those days. And I'm running for commissioner so I can help bring the city back. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, moving on to our second segment, which will consist of four questions. I will read the question, and each of you will have two minutes for a direct response. Your group opponent will have two minutes, and then each will have 30 seconds of rebuttal time. And Jane, thank you, by the way, for helping us. Jane will be our timekeeper. She will give you a 30-second warning and then let you know when time is up. So that's a gentle warning, and then her timer goes up by itself. Gentle. <laughs> and again, we're going to do this in, in numerical order. As I mentioned, and alphabetical. the issues we have in the Art Deco Cultural District affect our immediate area and can at times dictate the identity of all of Miami Beach. Therefore, there have been calls for solutions here that can possibly spread positive impact throughout our entire island and ultimately our global brand. For the first question, starting with group four and Mr. Asyam, I'd like to ask, do you agree with Mayor Gelber's vision that he shared with us back in July of 2020 to rebrand the MXC into the ADCD, the Art Deco Cultural District? And if so, what would be your plan to legislate the transformation from a hospitality-dominated economy into a diverse, live-work-play, balanced global brand? Thank you for the question. Two minutes time, please. Thank you. My vision for Ocean Drive is that I want people to come to Ocean Drive and be able to take pictures and enjoy it and share it with the world in a good way, not in a bad way that we're doing it right now. We have a $900 million budget. We don't have a PR and marketing company designated to Miami Beach, which is insane to me that nobody is taking care of our brand here in Miami Beach and in our entertainment district right here. I have a vision for Ocean Drive, which is part of a beautiful sculpture garden throughout this park, which will be recognized around the world and give a different reason why people should be coming to Ocean Drive and enjoying permanent sculptures, sculptures on, on rotation here. And in addition to that, it's imperative that we stop not having police officers designated to Ocean Drive. That cannot continue to happen. And what also cannot continue to happen is that we have 1,000 cameras in the city and not one person to watch them. 
They keep on talking about the bond money. We're waiting for the bond money for five years. Guess what? We don't need the bond money to have people watching the cameras. We need to hire the staff to watch the cameras. We have the system up. We just do not have any staff to do so. And so we need to transform and bring Ocean Drive back and give a different reason and a different brand to Ocean Drive. And I want to talk about what we're going to be able to do with Spring Break and whatnot that's happening in Ocean Drive because I have solutions for that as well. So for me, it's branding, bringing the different culture and bringing in the arts back into Ocean Drive, which will also bring in different restaurants and operators to come here because they're going to want to come here because the population that's coming here is different and will change the whole entire vibe of the area. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, we have the magnificence of Ocean Drive, both the natural beauty of this beach and the amazing and diversity, amazing diverse architecture that is the postcard of South Florida and really all of Florida's tourism. And we are not protecting it. I agree with my opponent. I am a marketing and branding professional. That's my entire career. And I will tell you that the Miami Beach brand is a brand that people would give body parts to be permitted to market. And the fact that we cede control over our narrative of this most stunning and iconic and unique stretch of beach in any city, let alone this city, to the GMCVB at best is insane. We are not controlling our narrative. We are not defining who we are. We are not enacting policies that elevate our game. We need to let the GMCVB fill our convention center, and we do need to hire a branding agency and a, a marketing agency to control the narrative, because we shouldn't be spending money to advertise, come to spring break in Miami Beach to college students, when they're not the problem. They know where, where spring break is, and they're not causing the trouble. The trouble is coming across the bridges. When, if anybody's ever lived in New York, we used to refer to them as the bridge and tunnel crowd, and that's what needs to be controlled. We have iconic, iconic visuals and activities. We are, other than Disney World, the single largest contributor to the state of Florida's resources financially. And if we don't control Ocean Drive, we lose that ability, and the state of Florida will lose that ability. We also need to make sure that we are protecting the architecture that is here, which is a big issue that I'm sure we'll talk about later, so we won't get into that. But we need to elevate our grain. We need to limit the number of events that come here. We don't need something going on every single week with blue tents and fried foods and generators. We need a handful of really thoughtful and diverse and incredible destination events for our residents and our visitors to enjoy. We have an overabundance of hotel rooms. And if anybody was watching the commission meeting recently or this evening, $60 a night is not what we should be charging to let people stay here in Miami Beach on Ocean Drive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you have, well, you have an opportunity. One second, guys. Mr. Arcion has an opportunity. You have a 30 second if you'd like to rebut or add anything. So I don't, I don't want to rebut anything repeated what I said about the marketing, which is great. I, I know that we're on the same page with this. But I got to tell you something else that we got to do. We got to actually clean our streets, our sidewalks, our attention to detail. If you walk down Ocean Drive, Kong's Avenue, it's disgusting. And talking about Disney, for me, is how clean are we at Disney standard? For me, Disney's at 10. I feel that we're a 3. And we need to cross every T and dot every I because all those things matter. did more than just repeat what my opponent said, but I'll let you decide that. There is a lot to talk about. We have unique opportunities. We don't have the accountability that we need in City Hall. We don't have food enforcement. We don't have noise ordinances in place that are reasonable and measurable. All of these things will help elevate our brand. It's not just about hiring a branding agency. It's us collectively, residents, organizations and the city working together to elevate our game. Thank you. I, I won't need my two minutes. Uh, first of all, 
before we can rebrand ourselves, we need to send a loud and resounding message around the world that the party is over. And I've been saying for 10 years, the party is fueled by those businesses right across the street which blast their music, they have dance performances, that all needs to be brought inside. And until that occurs, we can't rebrand anything. We've gone that down that road and it's just been on the money. Again, the message must be that the party is over. So what I want to do, I guess in this midpoint, is um, maybe ask Mitch, uh, Mr. Novick if he wants to just elaborate. And really the, the, the question again is, if you agree with rebranding the MXC into the ADCD, what would be your plan to legislate the transformation from a hospitality-dominated economy into a diverse live-work play? What would be your plan? Again, when I, when I moved here in 88, this was a thriving residential community. Everything we see now, the t-shirt shops, the tattoo bars, pizza shops, it's all a byproduct of the open air entertainment zone, which again, fuels the circus on the street. And until we address that, if elected, it will be addressed, then we can rebrand. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, two minutes. No matter, no matter what brand we want to be, no one's going to want to be here if they're afraid they're going to get shot. Okay? Uh, no one is going to want to bring their families here in fear of a stampede. And to Mitch's point, he's right. No one is going to want to do anything here on, on the MX Art Deco District if they are in fear of their lives. And I think before we make the effort to rebrand ourselves into something better, we have to let the but the rest of the world know that it's safe to come here. Okay, you know, just last month there was a, a biker gang, an ATV gang that came over from the mainland on four wheelers and dirt bikes, punched the resident in the face, and these guys were doing wheelies all up and down Ocean Drive on the sidewalks, and the cops were just attending to the injured victim. Oh, here. Are you telling me that you can't predict or see that there's a gang of bikers coming down from, from on the Venetian or 395 and you don't have a quick response team to turn them around? You know, I started off with this meeting saying accountability. We need to have accountability, not with just our city staff, but our police department. We need to make sure that there is an effective response on how to deal with public safety. And uh, thankfully, the public, the FOP, the Police union endorse me because they know that I'm going to give them the tools, what they need, to enforce the law. I want to talk about cleanliness. Although sanitation does a decent job in the mornings, you should see what it looks like before they arrive. I will say, two or three times a week, I need to hose down my poor porch. A vomit, people who've defecated, and that's been going on for way too long. So in terms of between the one and Disney clean, I would give us a one because we embraced this spring break atmosphere. And unfortunately, those we elect have done nothing to quell the problem. And what it comes down to or amounts to is campaign donations. Mr. Suarez. I also want to touch up on the fact that a lot of people that live in this area kind of just want to be left alone. You know, the fact that last year for spring break there was this monster quote unquote flow. And it was it was brought out where people were, were drinking and they went in the flow and we're also telling people not to come for spring break. I think there needs to be a point where we need to just lay off Lewis Park and let Lewis Park be a park. Let it be for the rest of us. Yes, to answer the question, absolutely. I agree 
that the brand and the image of Miami Beach and specifically Ocean Drive needs to change. However, what happened, and I say this respectfully, plans were proposed, but there was zero execution and zero action that followed along with it. This cannot be the brand and the identity that is synonymous and identifies Miami Beach. So how do we change that? Of course all of us don't want to see this. None of us want to see this. But how do we make that happen? Three plans of immediate execution, three action points that haven't been implemented. Prioritize public safety. Prioritize public right-of-way beautification. People shouldn't be getting shot on the heads or anywhere else to feel unsafe. I don't come down here with my family, my six-year-old daughter, because we don't feel safe, as do the majority of the other residents. There needs to be public beautification. When I first started coming to Miami Beach, this was pristine. It looked like Sandra Payer Pond. I was proud, even as a visitor, to come here. And we have lost that pride in our own city. It does not look like we respect ourselves, so other people are not going to respect us. And the third point in that action plan is work with the private business community with a carrot rather than a stick. And to the extent that the business models down here no longer work, it's an entire ecosystem that feeds off of each other. And we need to work as partners as opposed to adversaries with the private business community to make sure their business models are conducive to the city and the vision that we all collectively want to see. Enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. If you go down Ocean Drive today, it's very likely someone will try to sell you drugs yeah, openly in front of police officers. Uh, and this yeah. has been going on for way too long. And how is this acceptable? If we are not penalizing it, we're condoning it. You know, it, it, I have seen it time and time again. People open it with open containers, drunk and belligerent. I come to Ocean Drive all of the time because I love Ocean Drive. Ocean Drive brings back so many memories for me. I eat at News Cafe as much as possible because I have great fond memories there, and the food is great, the service is great. They shouldn't be penalized because the city is not enforcing the rules. We are at a point where people are drunk and disorderly in public, and we're allowing it. We're allowing the drug dealing. We're allowing people to smoke marijuana wherever they feel like. We're setting the stage. We are saying, hey, anything's cool here. Come, get drunk, do drugs, buy drugs. It's all good. That is not our brand. Our brand is Ocean Drive, the most iconic street in the world. When you say Miami Beach, it brings back, wow, this is a glamorous, amazing place where celebrities go, where there's films, where there's movies. This is a place that we need to cherish. We have the most amazing historic architecture. Why are we not protecting it? Why are we allowing our brand to be damaged and destroyed by lack of enforcement? So, my first step would be to start enforcing the rules. The next person that's going to start, yeah, they're listening. We're being too much. <laughs> we want some, you know, fighting. Come on. The next person that's going to start is is Miss Bot. So we've heard many agree. Uh, about how important the Art Deco district is. And the bottom line is, our Art Deco historic buildings are our heritage. And they are what makes Miami Beach, and particularly the Art Deco cultural district, so unique and special. I'm gonna quote, over the past 20 years, many academic studies have demonstrated that heritage tourism can generate up to 30% more revenue than any other type of tourism. Preserving, protecting, promoting our unique brand of Art Deco needs to be a part of a community mobilization strategy. For the second question, I'll start with Ms. Bach. Five. Group five? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. We'll start with Mr. Novick. Mr. Novick. Yep. We're in sorry. <laughs> okay. sorry, Tanya. It's okay. It's here. It's fine. So I... Mr. Novick. You ready? In light of the recent Cleveland 30-story publicity on Ocean Drive and political climate 
in Tallahassee. If elected, would you advocate for what residents consider good development, including the following, limiting FAR to protect our iconic architecture, repurposing our historic structures, and promoting heritage tourism globally? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, how? <laughs> the second part of the question is how. <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, these preemptions that are coming down from Tallahassee really are not allowing us to to. to choose what we want to be. They're dictating what we should become. And for that reason, you know, I've spoken with constitutional scholars. We have to fight this. You know, whether, you know, our infrastructure is burdened beyond belief, we can't accommodate this vision for this community. And if, if elected, I will fight like I always fight. And I usually fight too much. Yes. Yes, I, and I would take it a step further. You know, there's a lot of bad stuff coming up in Tallahassee. I think we can all agree on that. And I think now we're at a time where Miami Beach needs to fight back. And it's not just the Clevelander that's, that's coming. There's going to be more proposals. They're going to figure out a way to get around how we're blocking the Cleveland right now, just wait till next year. You know, the state has already preempted us from doing, from disavowing or dis not allowing short-term rentals in Miami Beach. And I think it's time we, we hire a new lobbyist, a, a real powerhouse lobbyist that will go to the state and advocate for us and maybe make a carbon for Miami Beach because our, our, our Art Deco history is what we are. And we need to put some serious dollars for a and lobbyists that can do that. That's one way way of doing it. Again, next year, likely floodplain or non-conforming building criteria may be imposed on us, which would really make the all of our historic districts illegal. So this needs to be fought to tooth and nail. And we need to send a clear message to those legislators who vote for this that their 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 livelihood in terms of their positions are on one. It's outrageous. You're good? Till the next the next one? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Make it simple, absolutely. And I have a 10-year track record of pushing back against bad projects. One, most recently, just two blocks away from here, the 13th of Washington micro-unit co-living project. It is now sitting empty and stagnant. So I have a track record of empty and stagnant. So I have a track record of doing so. I realized, now with all the state preemptions that the other commissioners were talking about, how vital it is that we elect people that are going to be on the front lines and understand this. Just recently on the planning board, I helped facilitate and pass voting in favor of a six-sevenths requirement for any FAR because that decision has been taken out of the hands of the voters. So it's even more critical that we raise the threshold of what is required at the city commission. So I supported that effort. And what's most important is our city starts being proactive instead of reactive. Again, respectfully, but it is a disgrace that it took an article on the front page of the Miami Herald about the Clevelander for our city to mobilize against these efforts. That act out of Tallahassee was known for months. And I alerted the city managers. Rapid transit zoning, which is another ordinance that could circumvent local control. Our city commissioners were this close from passing an ordinance that would have encouraged that and would have destroyed the fabric of our community until I alerted them of this. With 20 years in the private sector, finance sector, I can get out in front of these things. And instead of playing catch up, we can be 
proactive, like other cities, like Doral and Hollywood, that have been fighting against these state preemptions for months, as opposed to playing catch up and relying on the Miami Herald to, to essentially bring this to our attention. We all know how beautiful Miami Beach is and Ocean Drive, and there's a lot of money behind lobbyists who also know that, and they don't care about our historic properties. They can give to, as they, you know, what I was gonna say. But truthfully, we have to get out in front of this. It is our job to think responsibly. If these laws pass in the spring like they may, our historic properties are under attack. We are not going to be able to save them if these preemptions are not fought. What do we do? We should be proactive, like my, like my opponent says. We need to get in front of this. And how do we do that? We need to incentivize the right behavior. We need to help these properties adapt to the future. We need to figure out what do you need to do, what do you need from us as a city to save this historic property? What can we give you so that it's in your best interest to save this property? I have a friend who did the Esme Hotel, which I'm Española way. It cost him four times as much and took him four times as long to preserve this historic property. Why? We should be incentivizing this sort of preservation in our community. We need to help these developers do the right thing, restore these properties, and bring them up to their glory. Because if we don't, we are going to lose them, and then it will be too late. interesting is along most of the issues you won't find a huge diversity of opinion about what we need to do together, which is a real indication that the city is headed in the wrong direction. And part of that is because over the last number of years we haven't necessarily elected people who share the values that we share. And I will tell you that this election is critical to protect our historic districts, not just Ocean Drive, which obviously is why we're all here tonight. But anybody remember a little hotel called the Deauville that doesn't exist anymore? Okay, so that historic hotel district is under the same attack that Ocean Drive is, that all the beautiful homes along any of our waterways are, that are the fabric of our community. And when our, our mayor, I believe with reasonable intentions, said to the developer before understanding anything about the project, come on in, we will give you 4.5 FAR, the highest possible density in the city to build something here. And the developer said, great, we're going to build whatever we want, we're not gonna pay homage to what came before, we're not gonna talk to residents, and we're going to, on this already enormously large lot, oceanfront lot, build a monstrously large project. If we don't elect the right people who will stand up against developers and stand up to Tallahassee and work with the League of Cities and reach out to other historic cities along the coast of Florida, of which there are many, we are going to be in trouble. So this election, more than any, make sure you know who you're voting for and where they stand because we will be representing your desires. Make sure you know who you're elected. Thank you. So I think I was one of the first to send out an email of how disappointed I was with the possible development that's coming for the Cleveland area. And I think that we're all saying the same thing in the sense that if we don't find Tallahassee, they're gonna take off all control of what we can do and not do within our, 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 our rights here as the local government. I wanna go back real quick to the branding element because I do think that coming now during our Basel, the people who are coming here are not scared to come to Ocean Drive during Art Basel. And when you have a Carbone dinner on the beach, they're not scared to go to dinner at the Carbone event on the beach. 
And the reason why is because you're catering to a different clientele. You're marketing to a different clientele. You're elevating the brand of the location. So if you don't elevate the brand and create a reason of why people are going to come here to Ocean Drive and entertain and enjoy with a different brand, no one's going to want to bring their business here. No one's going to want to bring the restaurants here or a high-end hotel here if you don't change the demographic of the people that are coming. So we need to change the brand. We do need to create a proper cultural hub here at Ocean Drive and get rid of this BS entertainment that's going on here and give us a different reason for Ocean Drive. So that's all I want to say and I don't I mean that extra too So I can't speak to the mayoral candidates, but I, I believe that I was the first person to react to the news within hours of the Herald article about the Clevelander. And I was definitely the first person to point out that in addition to this outrageous proposal, it was a scare tactic, which doesn't mean we shouldn't be taking it seriously because we need to be taking it deadly seriously. But they can't build what they say they want to build. And moreover, they've met with the city officials. They don't have a proposal. They're trying to get our temperature, see if they can work with us to build something along those lines. Make sure you know who's representing you to stand up to these issues that really matter for our collective future. You can give the mic to the Joseph Magazine, please. So for our third group six with Mr. Magazine, in 1917, Loomis Park was sold to the city of Miami Beach with this deed restriction. Quote, the property herein conveyed to the town of Miami Beach is conveyed exclusively for park purposes and shall never be used for commercial or residential purposes. Mr. Magazine, what is your view for the future use, preservation, or development of Loomis Park? My view and what I will fight tooth and nail for is for it to be a park. It's how it was deeded, that's what it is, and that's what it will remain. And I can promise you of that. We have plenty of space in this city and in neighboring communities for commercial, for residential, and for hotels. An extra place for that, simplistically, is not Loomis Park. There are areas of this city, our entire city, is special and iconic to all of us. But there are areas of our city that go above and beyond everything else, that truly are separated and should be held apart. And Loomis Park is one of those. If I have anything, anything in this world to say about it, Loomis Park is, was, and will remain a park. It's a shame we both can't get elected because we agree on so many things. <laughs> like, but he's right, absolutely. Loomis Park needs to stay a park. These events and festivals that actually add no value to the residents' quality of life destroys the park. Every time there's a loaded and loaded up, it's so disruptive to the residents, to the hotel guests. What happens to the grass? It gets destroyed. You know, and it looks like a big muddy field as opposed to a beautiful park. Let's look at Central Park in New York City. What a great gathering place, a community place, where everyone can come and use the park and enjoy the park. That's what Loomis Park should be. It should not be a place where you go to buy drugs or to watch people get shot. This is not the brand of Miami Beach. We are Miami Beach and Ocean Drive is the most iconic street in the world. You tell anyone where Ocean Drive is, they know exactly where it is. It's Miami Beach. And when I tell people that I live in Miami Beach, it's like I've told them I live in heaven because it is a beautiful city and we need to protect our park and cherish it. So, well, before you're done, what I'd like to do is just ask each of you in your 30 second rebuttal, would you consider any exceptions? Would you distinguish between commercial use and nonprofit use? 
We have other activities that have been going on for years, so if you could just elaborate on that, please. I'm trying to think of the exceptions that I would be okay with, and they're not. Zero. No. It's a park. It was a park. It is a park, and it will remain a park. There's no commercial activity, there is no hotels, there is no residential, and there will be no exceptions. Can I ask a question? Does the beach classify as part of the park, or is that separate? We're just talking about the longest park. Okay, okay. So the park itself, I agree. I do like that. I, my background is as art, so I might, I'm the chair for art in public places. So like what Andres was saying, to have an activation which brings community together, like a sculpture park, is positive activation. I really enjoy the art fairs that happen on the beach, but they don't hurt the park. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Yes, so we're, we're, I've been saying the same thing of what I thought about, what I think about how the park should be activated. And it should obviously stay as a park. And this is my vision for the park. Having beautiful sculptures throughout the park that people could enjoy from the tales, kids sculptures, adult sculptures, and really up the brand of our park. And it's gonna give culture and activation and reason for locals and tourists to come and enjoy the park, sit under the sculptures, picnic under the sculptures, enjoy them during the day, enjoy them during the night, have dinner, walk, and enjoy late at night, over during the day, and it will really redefine Ocean Drive, and it will become all about the arts and not about the entertainment. So um, a, quick, a friend of mine has gone twice to City Hall over the course of a year to request information about Lomas Park, two times. Both times she was helped by a different clerk who said, what, where, what, uh, where is that, what is it? Goes to the accountability at City Hall. We need to make sure our employees know the city they're working in. It would be nice if our department heads lived here, but that's another topic for another time. The park is the park. We don't need arepas being fried on a Sunday morning. We don't need generators going Friday night. There are, it, it is a, there is not a lot of actual park green space of that magnitude in this city. It's the only park of that magnitude. If you compare it to Central Park, which is the treasure of Manhattan. They don't allow commercial activation except for very unusual, rare, and highly elevated circumstances. James Taylor, Paul Simon, Dave Matthews, Shakespeare the Park, but those things happen at best once a year, and they are major, right? So, no, nothing should be happening in that park other than perhaps planting more trees. It should remain a park, it should remain a passive park, I love sculpture. I would love to find another place to install sculpture that is not Lava's Park, but we need to protect that space. I can't imagine planning all year for a long weekend and coming to the Betsy Hotel, for instance, and paying $800 a night in high season to see somebody setting up those ubiquitous blue tents with their generators and their all-you-can-drink wrist bracelets, even as we say, we need to slow the party down a bit. We need to have people acting responsibly. We need to elevate our brand. I would be quite disappointed to say it, to say it mildly. So that's where I stand on the future of Lotus Park. So we have a, a, a first difference there. So uh, you don't feel that we should have any sculptures in the park. I feel that we should. I think that Art Basel changes the demographic of our visitors uh, that come over here during the park when there's installations, and I think it's going to be fantastic for you. So, you know, difference is good, and I think it is a, I think it's a lovely concept for Miami Beach. I just don't think Lummis Park is the place for it. And the next person actually Mr. Novick, if you can give it to Mr. Suarez, he can answer first. Okay. 
you know, when people come to Miami Beach and they stay on Ocean Drive on a weekend, it's, I'm sad to say, but it looks like a flea market. Okay, yeah. they're, they're, selling, they're selling items on there that you can buy on Amazon. And that's really not, that's not what Miami Beach, and specifically Loomis Park should be. Loomis Park should be left alone. You know, I, I, you know, I, <laughs> Mr. Asion and I agree on a lot of things, but I certainly do not want to see a sculpture park for Loomis Park. I think that opens up Pandora's box to other ideas or events that we may not want to have. I think we need to be, we need to draw a line in the sand and say, just enough is enough. You know, they did that for Pride Park, where they made that into basically a staging ground for the convention center. Our parks are under attack, and our city staff is using it as their playground and their staging, our staging ground. And I think, I think if the original intent for Loomis Park was to be a park where the residents can enjoy and not have to be burdened by events created by city staff who really have no idea what to do. I think that's what it should be. Okay, a little history lesson. In the 1870s, the father and son team of Charles and Henry Lum purchased the land south of today's 14th Street, 35 cents an acre. They planted a hundred or a couple hundred thousand coconuts with the dream of having a coconut planting. Again, this is before the city of Miami Beach became a company. But that dream, unfortunately, turned into failure. And the Lummis brothers, who reached over the bank in downtown, took deed of it. And I'm glad they sold for $40,000 the land with a restrictive covenant stating that there should be no commercial exploitation. And it has been me who, since that artisanal market, fortunately it was removed in July, that we go up to the, you know, publicly at the Stuttgart Forum every month, chastising that plan, which was in violation of the spirit, uh, against the uh, spirit of the Lummis Covenant and the County Parks Charter. Char which, which prohibits uh, commercialization in the park. Today, unfortunately, our commissioners have uh, given uh, a planner, Bernard Zistovich, uh, in excess of $650,000 to design a plan which relocates Ocean Drive onto what are the vestiges of the Long Plantation. What you see out there are you know, are the vestiges of what was, what grew out in the early 1900s. The Ziskovitz plan is entirely a money grant because five million was allocated with the geo bond for Lummis Park and 20 million was allocated for Ocean Drive. If they can't touch Ocean Drive, which has very little infrastructure on to, uh, below it, uh, they can't grab that money. So again, I would urge everybody to oppose the plan. It's in the works right now. Uh, it, and it's a de desecration of what we have. Uh, that is our postcard. Okay. All right. So we will go to our fourth and final question in this segment. And Sarsion, it will be uh, your turn. <laughs> so. Though we all agree that uh, police and code have overwhelming and difficult jobs, residents, especially in the ADCD, still feel that they can be more visible, proactive, and consistent in enforcing our laws, particularly the low-level misdemeanors that greatly impact our quality of life. Keeping in mind the city's budget, how would you legislate change that will enable both these departments to do their jobs more effectively and proactively, acknowledging that we cannot police our way out of crime? Thank you. We cannot police our way out of crime. And I just want to mention that almost every major park around the world has sculptures in them to bring beauty and elegance to these parks. And I've been mentioning it since I started talking, 
there is no, there are no cops designated to Ocean Drive. Ocean Drive is the most important, iconic street in South Florida. How is it possible that we do not have two officers designated to Ocean Drive? It's insane. It needs to stop immediately. They need to be patrolling Ocean Drive back and front, east, west, north, and south. And they do not move. They're like off-duty police officer for Ocean Drive, but they're on duty. The second thing is that we need more officers because there's many businesses here on Ocean Drive and in Collins and Washington that want to be able to hire off-duty police officers to add more security. But guess what? They can't hire them because we don't have enough police officers for them to hire. So when the restaurants and the businesses want to have an off-duty cop there to add more presence, we don't have them. And we have to stop that. So it is dark. How much time do I have? So thank you. So it is important that we do it right away. Have two officers designated to Ocean Drive. They don't move. They have a beat. It's Ocean Drive. That we have people watching our cameras immediately. We don't need to wait another day. And we need to stop the national anthem of Ocean Drive from being coke and weed, coke and weed. Because you cannot walk by Ocean Drive, we're not being offered coke and weed. And we need to stop it immediately. Thank you. Well, everybody can breathe easy again because here in Congress, and I do agree 100%, everything that Congress said is right on the money. I would, I would add to that. Does everybody know what the broken windows theory of policing is? Hands up. Okay, so in case you don't, it's the notion that if you don't, if you don't maintain a street or a neighborhood and it starts looking a little run down, then it's going to attract behavior that increases the fact that it's run down. People won't mow their lawns, they won't fix gutters, they'll dump tires in their front yards, people come and, you know, sell drugs on the corner. We have a gorgeous home. We are not taking care of it properly, and people do not treat it with the same respect they would treat their mother's living room. And that needs to stop yesterday. Basic blocking and tackling. In addition to what Andres and, and I'm sure you'll hear from the other candidates it, are saying, we need to make sure that the streets are clean and that the alleys don't smell like pee. And we should be beautifying the alleys. What a great opportunity for street art or additional plantings and wall plants for resiliency factors. We need to make sure that water doesn't lay stagnant in the alleys. We need to make sure that we don't let the people who singing the Ocean Drive National Anthem of Coke and Weed are on every corner without police moving them along. It is not okay that this happens and that People run off the beach, there are bathrooms every two blocks, but yet they feel completely at ease to drop their drawers and be between the street and the cars. We need cops who know if a blade of grass is out of place. This is our revenue generator. What happens here happens around the world, and we need officers who can take as much care and pride in and of Ocean Drive, as we all do, because they want it to be shining the way we want it to. It will, by the way, make their jobs easier in the long term, because if people aren't coming to do terrible things because they know they won't get away with it, then they won't have to be dealing with people who are coming here across bridges to do terrible things. So it's this, this virtuous cycle. Yeah. Just to add to what Tony was just saying, is that clean is very relative to who's looking at a sidewalk, to give you an example. You could walk by a sidewalk and say, oh, there's not a bag of trash there. But it has 10,000 pieces of gum embedded into it, and there's not one red mark on it. It's all dirty, you know, black marks all over the sidewalk, which kills the look, going back to the brand. How clean are we? Disney clean. That mentality has to stick to everybody working in this city, especially here. By the way, we haven't talked about the closure of the street on between 13th and 15th. I'm curious to know that.
In addition to what Ambassador said, there is actually, there used to be something called the cleanliness uh, index. Is anybody, is anybody familiar with that? Okay. The, the usual suspects are. Okay, so it was put on pause for a few years, but I'm thrilled to report that it's coming back online in October. And what that is, is a team of, I believe it's five part-time city employees, but there are city employees who have a, have training and full manual of how things look. It's not code enforcement, but it's, has the gun been taken off the streets? Are the red sidewalks fading? And they go through and, and look at this. So if you're not starting to see some small improvements in the beginning of the year, call us who are now one, three of us will be elected. So, you know, call us and let us know, we'll get on that. Okay, you can give the mic to Mr. Melvin. Can you recite the question? Absolutely. <laughs> Keeping in mind the city's budget, how would you legislate to enable both of these departments, the police and code, to do their jobs more effectively and proactively? Keeping in mind we cannot basically police our way out of crime. You know, I first said that in 2013, 2014, when Mayor Levine was in office. I spoke at the Stutnik Gala expressing my dismay at the deterioration and decay of this neighborhood. And I said, don't throw money at the police to dress the zoning, which I spoke about earlier, to clean the problem. He came up with a grandiose, grandiose plan. We're gonna plan, we're gonna have a blue ribbon panel, the Ocean Drive Task Force. And again, it hasn't gotten any better, folks. And moreover, this is not a revenue generator. We're paying for this to a net loss to between six and two, I think I may have said 38, six and 28 million dollars, according to the city's own numbers. So again, the problem, the crux of the problem are those businesses which exploit the public realm. It's what I said nearly a decade ago, and it's still the problem today. We need to take the party off the street, bring it inside. I'm not saying close anyone down. And that is when we can reemerge as something else. I, I don't believe in. I don't believe that you cannot police your way out of crime. There's crime, and we have law. We have law, and we have enforcement. And if there's a crime, then we need to enforce the law. It's very simple. You, we get police officers out of their cars patrolling Ocean Drive. And I think that will go a long way to enforcing the law. We have, I mean, just like before, and said, you, know, you walk down the street, people are selling you weed and coke. I'm, I'm, I could be pushing my baby stroll on, they'll still be selling you weed and coke. I would be in favor of expanding the police department and the detective unit to catch these drug dealers on the street, actually make a real sting operation to, to, to get this element off of our streets. And if we have to, you know, they say that, you know, when we, get, when we arrest them, they're put in jail and they're out before we can even get them the reports done, <clears throat> then let's put them in the worst bureaucratic process ever. We can get a bus with peanut butter jelly sandwiches, and just make a living hell out of the day for them. And, and every time they try to sell them, put them through this bureaucratic process, it's just gonna be, they're gonna take their, their business somewhere else. And not to say, not to say some walls of my beach, but off of the beach. So, you know, I think, I'm not in favor of defunding the police. I wanna fund the police and the right, and the right departments to get specific and searchable on how to enforce the law. In, in August through December of 2017, the city, our commissioners and mayor, conducted a test prohibiting the businesses along Ocean Drive and requiring those businesses to keep their volume down. According to our former police chief, Dan Oates, crime had plummeted 14%. As someone who lives here, I can attest that Vehicular noise stopped. It was non-existent. 
And then came December when that test was sunset. Uh, you may remember, I believe his name was Kamir Patel. Patel shot in the head on Espanola Way. And then a week later, I have a woman kicking her foot barefoot through a BMW window. There's a causal relationship between the noise on our street and the behavior. I've been saying it all along, and for whatever reason, those we elect is not. I don't believe that if you bring a party inside, there's going to be somehow a stop to drug sales on Ocean Drive. I mean, uh, it, they have a business operation, and whether you have the windows and doors open or not, people are going to sell drugs because they know they can get away with it. And until we have a police department that enforces the law on Ocean Drive, it's going to continue that way, whether or not the, the, the party's inside or outside. In any organization, any group, Culture is set from the top down. Whether that be a Fortune 500 company, a sports team, or your own family, the culture of any group or community is set from the top. And that's where it needs to start. There is no coordination amongst our city leaders. Because of my 10 year track record of fighting back against spring break chaos, of fighting back against the nightclub owners that bring acts of performance acts here, that promote violence. The Miami Beach Fraternal Order Police unanimously endorsed my campaign. But I sat with the president of the FOP, and I said, I hope this isn't a rhetorical question. But in meetings, how many times prior or after spring break has the FOP, the chief of police, a mayor and commissioners, and maybe Dave Grogman or David Wallach or some of the prominent nightclub owners in this city all been in the same room and said, we need to figure this out together. Because I do believe a rising tide lifts all boats. And sadly, he says none. How is that possible that in 10 years, there is not coordination amongst our business community, our first responders, and our city administration and staff? That lack of coordination is unacceptable. And again, culture is set from the top, and I will set that from day one. So what can we do? Let's talk about action plans. We need to press the business owners that are bringing this chaos and the crime and let them know that we need to be in this together as a community, work together collectively, and then provide enforcement. But it can't just be here along Ocean Drive because this entire thing, this entire community is an ecosystem. So we can't just start fighting the crime when it gets onto Ocean Drive. We need to attack it vociferously and unrelenting right from the second you enter the city and let people know that are bringing trouble here, things have changed because you entered into Miami Beach. It didn't get easier, it got harder to sit here and bring crime, chaos, and violence. Clean streets are safe streets. It's been proven. Cleanliness and safety go hand in hand. Like I said before, I've lived in this area for a very long time. My first apartment, 22 years ago, I remember what this city looked like when it was clean and safe. I would walk around at any time of day and I never felt unsafe. It's a different story now. If, and you know, we, we don't have to go that far to see what an example of this looks like. Just drive into Surfside, go into Bell Harbor in the Bay Harbor Islands, you could eat your dinner off the floor. I mean, I've seen the same gum marks on Washington Avenue that I've seen for the past 22 years. What happened? Why did we stop caring for our city? One of my first initiatives is the Clean Streets Miami Beach. I'm going to make it a priority to clean Miami Beach and make it glisten again because that's what we deserve. This is our home and it shouldn't look like garbage because if it looks like garbage, people are gonna treat it like garbage. 
We know that already. There's no reason why people should be defecating in front of storefronts of people who are trying to have a business. There's no reason why people should be cleaning this up. There's no reason why we have to fight with drug dealers on every corner. This is our city. We need to take pride in it, and we need to make it clean and safe. Before we move to our next segment, I'd like to actually recognize Fabian Basabi. Thank you for being with us, our House Representative. Thank you for joining us today. So we can move on to our third, uh, third segment. Basically, this is in the form of a lightning round. Each of you will have 30 seconds to give us a clear and concise response to each question. The first stop is Mr. Novick. And the question is, do you support the current configuration of, of the Ocean Drive promenade? And what is your ultimate desire for Ocean Drive's traffic pattern? Yeah, absolutely not. I consider myself a victim of pedestrianization when the test, when Ocean Drive was entirely closed. My block, the 100 block, was total traffic gridlock. The hour, which the Department of Transportation agrees was never designed to handle the traffic capacity a closed ocean drive creates. And if that should expand, my attorneys are ready to, to challenge it. And like, like, like it's been challenged before, we, we will expect victory. I can say right now that what the configuration we have now with Hilly two blocks being pedestrianized and the rest, I, I don't think that's working. I think we either go all in or pull out. And I don't, right now, if we pedestrianize, we haven't had the infrastructure to, to, to accommodate the, the lack of traffic. So yeah, I, I don't want to be governing that's going to shut down businesses and make them hard to, to get the delivery trucks. But I also can appreciate that Having it pedestrianized is beautiful. And I haven't really made up my mind about that yet, but I would need a researcher. What are you leaning towards? What are you leaning towards? In, in its current form, I don't think it's working out. Mr. Magazine? I do lean towards pedestrianization, but it would come with input from the community. But what I do not support is this one foot in, one foot out approach. Like so much of our city, it just looks like we remain in purgatory. So if we are going to pedestrianize the northern end, it has to be real. And we have to have conviction and move forward with the execution of that idea. If it's pedestrianized, it can't just look like, okay, well, there's no cars, but here's a yellow, dirty sidewalk and a bunch of cheap plastic chairs on the table. It should be one of the most iconic and recognizable world-class places in this entire city region, and world. This is how I feel about it. Right now, when the streets are closed during spring break, we are setting the stage for mayhem and murder. That's not what we want. We have to clean our city up before we close these streets. Because right now, when we close the streets, we just set a bigger stage for all of these people to wreak havoc on our streets. That doesn't help the business. That doesn't help the people who live in the neighborhood. I agree that what happened in the north end of Ocean Drive is fantastic. They've got it nicely programmed. Mr. Ocean. Thank you. You know, it's a, it's a difficult situation. You have people on the north side, like the Betsy, who love the way that it is, and they're sitting outside of the Betsy, eating there, and you're, in, you're looking out, East, it looks beautiful. You have no mayhem, you have the park, you can eat quietly. If you go to the south side, you know, you have a lot of the traffic and you have the cars going over to the hotels. And some of the businesses want that over there. The alley doesn't work and it looks disgusting. You can't have traffic coming southbound, going through that alley for two blocks to then turn east and then go back onto Ocean Drive. My middle solution is go from 5th Street, head north, and on 13th, you make a left, and both lanes on 13th Street move up to Washington Avenue. 
as a middle ground. So the current closure of the top two blocks have resulted in fewer calls for service for police and rescue of various stripes. And a particular business owner who lists two identical restaurants in Ocean Drive, one in that two block area and one in further south, has reported revenues going up significantly at the pedestrian island's end. Moreover, having grown up all over the world and choosing to make Miami Beach my home 21 years ago, I have seen, and this goes back to your cultural tourism question, pedestrianization works when it's planned for. So to close it during COVID and expect that chaos won't ensue when it is the only place to go is not a fair taste a test case. So let's plan it properly, let's pedestrianize, and let's protect this area. Thank you. It's tough to answer these questions, but we did 30 seconds just to get clear and concise answers. Uh, moving on to our next question, Mr. Suarez is going to be answering this up first. All right, and remember, 30 seconds. Are you for 2 a.m. or 5 a.m. shutdown time for alcohol sales, citywide, with restrictions? I, I used to be very pro 2 a.m. And you know, I, I used to think that if I take a shotgun approach and, and, and do that, that'll solve all the problems. But as I meet, as I meet business owners, as I engage with the community, I think we can have a more surgical approach on how to deal with the mayhem of, of Miami Beach without punishing the bad operators and rewarding the good operators. And, you know, I will be the first to admit that if, if after two years it doesn't work, I'll be in favor of, of a 2 a.m. last call. You know, I was for 2 a.m. citywide without exceptions, because I understand exceptions lead to lawsuits. Uh, but it, it, in this area, I believe 2 a.m. is warranted for new businesses opening up, 2 a.m. I believe is warranted, but those businesses that are existing, they should be able to keep their 5 a.m. occupational license. Ms. Novello. I don't believe in blanket solutions to problems. I think it's irresponsible for us to punish people who are doing the right thing. <clears throat> Twist, for instance, has been open for 30 years. If we did a 2 a.m. rollback, we would destroy the, one of the last gay establishments in Miami Beach. That wouldn't be fair. There are good operators and there are bad operators, and we need to deal with them as it comes and see what's appropriate for each community and neighborhood. What do the, what do the residents want? What do the neighbors want? I also do not favor a blanket 5 at 2 a.m. rollback. However, in areas where it makes sense for new businesses, that is where we start to shift the pendulum to a more low-key residential feel. And I've pushed for that on the planning board, on West Avenue and Alton Road and Bell Isle. I've supported and pushed forward a 2 a.m. rollback for new businesses. However, we have a lot of good operators. And for a long, long time, Nightlife and entertainment elevated Miami Beach. We've gotten to an area where it detracts from it now, but we have to use a surgical approach against the bad operators and elevate the good ones. So the voters spoke on this, and they said 2 a.m., and I am inclined to adhere to what the voters wanted. I don't want to put anyone out of business. I want to do this prospectively, so I don't believe we need to be granting new 5 a.m. licenses. Moreover, I do believe that anybody who has a 5 a.m. license that is not a spectacular example of how to run such a business should be put on notice. Because if you can't run your business, or if your business model is based on the two hours or a couple of hours before closing at 5 a.m., your business needs to be reevaluated. So this 2 a.m. thing all started because we couldn't be able to control Ocean Drive. 2 a.m. here has nothing to do with what happens at Live Night Club or at Twist, which has never had a police incident over at the club. So for me, 
5 a.m. unless there's a residential neighborhood. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have a 5 a.m. in a residential neighborhood. But besides that, I'll grandfather would be all sitting, and I will keep it the way that it is. Okay, great, thank you. For our next question, I will first read what the job of a Miami Beach commissioner is. Quote, through the enactment of ordinances and resolutions, the review and approval of bids and contracts, and the awarding of certificates and proclamations, the City Commission works to improve the quality of life, economic development, and enhance communication between city government and the community. Mr. Magazine, you're up. I have a question for you. If, if you are elected, what would be your first proposed ordinance or referral that you would present to your commission colleagues for approval? And this is again, taking into account the entire ecosystem. On day one, I will work with my colleagues to put a moratorium on any residential housing being converted into transient usage. That has wide ranging, far reaching effects on everybody in this room and our entire community. Miami Beach, our quality of life is being decimated because residential multifamily buildings are being taken offline, our neighbors kicked out of their homes to turn them into short-term rental transient hotels to bring the party crowd into our neighborhoods. That stops on day one. Thank you. Thank you. So I've already told you about the clean streets Miami Beach, so I'll go into my second item, which is conversion of short-term rentals into long-term leases. We need to talk to these owners and the building owners and say, how do we incentivize you to transition your short-term rental into a long-term lease? We need to reinforce good behavior and not pun and, and punish bad behavior. But if we give the incentives, it's like my opponent said, it's like a carrot and a stick. I have children, so I know when I give them positive reinforcement, it always works better than negative. Thank you. Ms. Sassoon. You know, two things for me is immediately put up an RFP for a proper marketing PR company for our city. We need to control our brands again, and we need to control our narrative and not have us be what we're putting out there that we are. And that would be my first one because I know that my, my other fellow commissioners have other things that are also important as well. I think the biggest issue that we're facing that we can enact a, a quicker change on is the affordable housing crisis, whether it is decimating our hotel industry or our residents who are being forced out of their homes. So I would support Joe in enacting a moratorium on conversion of any transient, any residential buildings to transient use in any way, shape, or form, whether it's a proper hotel or anything else. Yeah, regarding the glut of hotel rooms, I heard the commissioners discussing hotel rates tonight between $50 and $100 for the night. We have thousands of hotel rooms in the pipeline to be built. I believe we should take it a step further and have a moratorium on hotel use and encourage residential, affordable residential development in this community to bring back a residential base because it is residents that make the community, not transits. The drawback of going last. I can tell you right now, I'm gonna be the most anti-Airbnb short-term rental candidate you will ever see, okay? I'm not, no, I'm not only in favor of putting a moratorium on any future short-term rentals, I want to go after the existing ones. I want to go after the existing ones of residential neighborhoods that were somehow approved when they should have never been approved. And there's two types. There's ones operating illegally and there's ones operating legally. And I want to get our legal department on them. I want to get code on them. And I want to make it very difficult for them to operate and incentivize them to go back to residential. Okay, the next question, thank you. The next question will be for Ms. Novella. And this is the last question in our lightning round. I'd like for you all to take the opportunity within each of your groups just to let us know what makes you stand out from your opponent. 
Why should the registered voters support you? I come from a different lens. I grew up in Miami Beach. I have lived here as a taxpayer for over 22 years. I've been on city boards for over a decade. I'm coming from a background of arts and culture, and I think arts and culture is our future. We need to stop this nonsense with the spring break and the party crowd, and we need to focus on things that are gonna elevate our quality of life, and that is arts and culture. And I plan to make Miami Beach the arts and culture destination of the world. Two things I say will differentiate me. One, my proven track record. Every single issue we've talked about here tonight has been important. I have advocated publicly and taken the hard, hard decisions and gotten involved in our community over the past 10 years, whether that's fighting for affordable housing, whether that's pushing back against the nightlife special interest and the spring break chaos, and all the other issues that we've talked about. I've been one of the most active and engaged residents of our city over the past 10 years. And I bring 20 years of finance experience that is unprecedented in our city government. I have a financial background they can work on a $900 million city budget that no other candidate or no other person on the commission can bring that expertise. I've worked with hundreds of local governments across the country on the challenges facing Miami Beach, like infrastructure, resiliency, and urban planning. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. I think what separates Mitch and I is my focus is on quality of life issues. And I have a proven track record that, that proves that. I, I fought against short-term rentals in my neighborhood, and within 80 days, I was able to remove the last vestiges of short-term rentals in my neighborhood on two readings unanimously. And one of the other accomplishments I'm very proud of is the abuse of disabled placards in, in residential parking. So I don't know if you know, but two years ago, you could park anywhere in Miami Beach with a handicap. And I worked with Mark Samuelin to remove that ordinance so that valley operators were not able to abuse our parking in residential neighborhoods. Well, for me, it's experience, qualifications, and accomplishments. In 2005, I instigated an FBI, FDLE investigation, which culminated in the arrest and conviction of three high-ranking city employees for which began as an appearance of impropriety and corruption regarding the infamous Coral Rock House a block away from here. Other successes, I fought and saved renowned American artist Jack Stewart Apollo Nero, which is now being conserved and restored at a cost which will exceed a million dollars that it the Amon Group Hotel developer is paying for, and that has already been approved for installation on the new fire station. And there's many of these incidents, or instances, where I fought injustice and won. Many front page stories as well. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Thank You've already heard about my role in Miami Beach United and on the board of NDPL. In case you didn't know, I am also the vice chair of the planning board on which I served for three years. So I have unrivaled experience. I also have unmatched passion for the city. We all clearly care about the city, but this has been what I do with my free time. I grew up with the great good fortune of living around the world, and I chose to make this city my home to raise my children almost 21 years ago. So I know there are great solutions around the world that will serve us better than just looking around the tri-state area, the revolving door of Miami Beach, Miami Dade, and the city of Miami. I am by far the best qualified candidate to run for office. Thank you. Thank you. So me and my family have lived in 33139 since I was born to today, which is 48 years. I've worked in the mayor's office in Miami for four years. I am on the uh, board of the Miami Beach Board of Adjustments, and I was on the Miami Beach Convention Center Advisory Board when the Convention Center was built. My passion for this city and Miami Beach is second to none. This is my home since I was born. 
I love a scene and I want to give back in every element, whether it's for affordable housing or whether it's our, our living here in Miami Beach on Ocean Drive. Every single segment of this city is important to me. Thank you. Mr. Asini, this is an opportunity for your closing words. This is our last segment. Each of you have one minute. Yes. Thank you. I thank you for being here. You know, I have a passion of paying it forward. I have my own foundation for the past 15 years. I live to pay it forward and give it back. I own six properties here in Miami Beach, and I've made uh, my career here in the city of Miami Beach. And nothing is more important to me to pay back and give back to my community. And this is one big way for me to be able to do that. At Beach High, in six months, we're gonna open the doors to the first ever state-of-the-art culinary program for Beach High for the students there at Beach High. We're also gonna open up next week the first ever free food pantry for families with food insecurities that I'm bringing into Beach High. Not only am I bringing it into Beach High, but I'm gonna bring it into every single school in Miami Beach. It's gonna have a free food pantry for families in need. I care about the city. I care about the seniors. I care about the teens. I care about the kids. I care about people who don't have and people who have. And we are going to make the city much better than I found it when I started living here. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a big election. For the first time in 10 years, four seats on the commission will be changing hands. And I say not a moment too soon. If anybody's watched a commission meeting in the last few years, it's been embarrassing. It's a circus and it is an example of how not to run a meeting and how not to be collaborative and collegial with your colleagues. It's it's a pox on our city and we residents are paying the price. I have led organizations, 15 person volunteer boards who've gone through the same agenda that the city goes through. And we have had very different opinions, but guess what? We never had to call a timeout or a recess to get the work done. It's been said of me, not by anybody up here, none of, nobody running for commission, but in this election cycle that I'm not wanted on the commission because I can't be controlled and I can't be bought. Those words are a very accurate assessment and I cannot imagine a better, higher compliment. Thank you. Like all the candidates, I'm passionate about Miami Beach. I've served since 1994 on the board of MDPL. I've served a total of 33 years on various land use boards, blue ribbon panels and committees. Uh, I'm, again, passionate about this city, and I believe, if elected, things will change, especially in this nation. I'm raising my family here, and I'm here to stay. I've got skin in the game. I'm making an investment in our future. I self-funded my campaign because I, if I get elected, I don't want to go in there on day one and owe anyone favors. The only favors that I owe anyone is the residents, and I truly believe that. I've made a pact that I will not be with any lobbyists if I get elected, and I will always be a vote for you, the residents, because that's who I represent. I don't represent special interests, I don't represent the hotel industry, I don't represent anyone else, I represent you guys. If you guys have a problem, you can call me. You have my cell phone number, I will pick up the phone at any time of the day. I want to be the most easily accessible commissioner on that day. Thank you. First, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge all of the commission candidates up here. This is not an easy process, and I truly believe we have every person up here is for the right reasons, that they love our city, their families should be proud of them, and they should be proud of the jobs that they're doing. This is an easy process. But even more than that, I want to thank you all, right? Because this is what Miami Beach is. It's great to have Carbone in the Fountain Blue, and all those fancy things that become synonymous with Miami Beach. But if you ask me what I most cherish about this city, that my entire family lives in, it is the people. 
that is what makes Miami Beach. There is a lot of sand in Florida. There's a lot of sand in other places. But this is our home and this is our community. And it is the people. The people in this room are friends, our neighbors. That we go to synagogue, church, school, play sports with, go to museum with. That is what makes up our community. And that is who I want to have the honor to represent. If I could make this campaign about one word, that's the word it would be about, is community. A couple times a day, people ask me, how's it going? And I always answer the same way. Amazing. This has been the journey of a lifetime. I can't tell you how much I have loved every single second of this because you know what I get to meet and talk to these amazing people who are here in this community. I meet interesting people who love our city just as much as we all do and we all want to see a different future for our city. It's breaking our hearts that our city is getting the bad rap that it is because we know living here that it's not that bad. We live in paradise. We need to clean up our act and be the world-class city that we deserve because we deserve it. Us, as our community, we deserve a clean and safe place to live. And it is such an honor for me to be here and throughout this whole journey. And no matter what happens, this has been a journey of my lifetime and I thank you all for being part of it. Thank you all. I uh, would like to take this opportunity to see if anybody in the audience has any questions for our candidates. Um, go right here. Thank you. I promised my neighbors I wasn't going to say anything today, but I can't help it. <laughs> my, I have been a resident here for a long time, coming down 29 years. The, I have two major issues I'd like to address. Number one, it seems to me, I, by the way, I hardly ever go on Ocean Drive. I mean, it's really been so bad that the only place I would venture to is Miami, and it is the event scene, and of course today. So you can, I mean, you, this has been the turnoff for me, and I bet some of you probably live closer than I do. I live at 100 Lincoln Road. But I have observed that the businesses on Ocean Drive are constantly fighting the, 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 the city. They won't do anything to improve the situation. And I wonder how you feel about that, number one, and then I'll ask my other question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, 30 seconds if you could each. So it's a disaster. Parenting, assistance, every single time you go to the city to get anything done, it's like red tape galore. If we want to bring in businesses that actually you want to patron, you want to be a part of, we need to roll out the red carpet to help them out. But if we close up Ocean Drive and there's no car traffic and we shut down at 2 o'clock in the morning and we don't bring in something to attract people like sculptures and art into the Ocean Drive, it's going to die. Because every single business that's there is not going to be able to get replaced because nobody's going to want to come here. Continue to exactly what you're saying. We need to roll out the red carpet for our businesses and help them. Anybody else wants to take the question? Yeah, I, you know, we have a lot of laws on our books. We do a lousy job enforcing them. If we literally enforce the laws that we have on our books about signs, about hawking, about price gouging on the menus, we would very quickly separate the wheat from the chaff on Ocean Drive. And we could then incentivize and reward the excellent operators, of which there are many, and get rid of the lousy operators. Three strikes, you're out. This is our city, one of the most stunning streets in the country, and it is your good fortune to be here. It's not a God-given right. So we need to enforce the laws we have on our books and make sure we elevate our collective game. My entire professional life, my entire professional career has been set around economic development. But never have I seen a city in my entire life that has such an adversarial relationship between its residents and our business community. And I said the line earlier, but I truly believe in it, a rising tide lifts all boats. We need to get to a point 
where our interests are not mutually exclusive, where it is not 5 a.m. chaos and violence or residential quality of life. As I said, culture starts at the top and we need leadership that essentially aligns the interests of our business community with the city that our community, our residents want to see. Well, Ms. Novella answered this last, and I just looked at the time. We are running out of time, so unfortunately, yes, and what we'll do is we can actually just have you all ringo with the candidates. If you have any questions, you can ask them directly, okay? I have a question. Oh, we need to do We need to do a better job to attract local businesses back to our community. When businesses come to our community to open businesses, it could take them two years to get a license and a permit. A lot of businesses go out of business before they can even open. That's irresponsible. If we look around Miami, we see the different neighborhoods. There's Michelin star restaurants opening in Coconut Grove, Little Haiti, Design District. We can have those restaurants here in our community if we just help them. So again, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our uh, forum. She's okay, wonderful. Yes, I'm, I'm, if you have any other questions, you can ask the candidates uh, directly. But I just want to thank you all for attending and uh, with us learning more about the candidates. We look forward to more debates and talking to our elected officials. Thank you. Thank you.